While I think most Americans are aware that France provided invaluable support during the American Revolution, the role that was played by Spain is not nearly as well remembered. It's easy to forget that Spain controlled most of the territory west of the Mississippi River and remained a powerful, if aging, player in American colonization. Spain provided vital monetary and logistical support early in the revolution, but also contributed to the Patriots' cause directly through a military campaign against the British in Florida. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Following their defeat in the Seven Years' War, known as the French and Indian War in the United States, France and Spain gave up considerable land in the Americas to Great Britain. Spain gave up La Florida in exchange for the return of Cuba, which had been captured by Britain during the war. France ceded control of much of New France in the Treaty of Paris, including most of its territory east of the Mississippi River, with the exception of New Orleans. Nearly all of French Louisiana has actually been transferred from France to Spain in 1762, although the agreement was secret at the time. By 1776, the Spanish controlled most of the modern U.S. west of the Mississippi, while Britain controlled the land east of it. The end of the Seven Years' War left tensions among the European rivals high. When the United States declared independence, France and Spain were both interested in supporting the rebellion of Britain's colonies. Both sent considerable supplies to the Patriots in the years immediately after the Declaration. Spain provided loans and supplies, notably through the Gardoki family trading company, which supplied 215 bronze cannon. 30,000 muskets, 30,000 bayonets, 51,314 musket balls, 300,000 pounds of powder, 12,868 grenades, 30,000 uniforms, and 4,000 field tents during the war. Despite concerns over antagonizing the British, by February of 1777, the Spanish crown was instructing Bernardo de Galvez, the colonial governor of Louisiana, to sell supplies to the Americans. On February 6, 1778, France officially allied with the United States with the signing of the Treaty of Alliance, which massively altered the scope of the war. Great Britain was no longer fighting to put down a few wayward colonies, but fighting a global war with a world power bent on regaining territory lost in the Seven Years' War. The expansion would help to relieve the pressure on the struggling United States. Spain concluded a successful war with Portugal with the signing of a treaty in March of 1778. It was not yet ready to officially declare support for the American cause. The moment is not yet come for us. The war with Portugal, France being unprepared, and our cargo ships from South America not having arrived, makes it improper for us to declare immediately, wrote a Spanish diplomat to an American one in Madrid. While the Spanish were not yet ready to declare war, they were already planning on it and prepared for their entrance. On May 8, 1779, they officially entered the war on the side of the Americans in support of their ally, France. In Europe, Spain attacked British positions at Gibraltar and Menorca, though ultimately they would fail to recapture Gibraltar even after years of siege. Spain would fight throughout the war in the Americas as well, in the Midwest, at the Battle of St. Louis in 1780 when they repelled a British attack, and in 1781 when a detachment of troops captured Fort St. Joseph in modern-day Michigan. Most importantly, Galvez and soldiers from Spanish Louisiana embarked on a campaign against British positions in Florida along the Gulf Coast, which would ultimately provide valuable strategic victories to the American cause. The Gulf Coast Campaign, as it came to be known, began in 1779, shortly after Spain's declaration of war. Two months after the declaration of war, the Spanish crown authorized colonial subjects to engage the British. Governor Galvez got word of the authorization on July 21st and immediately planned offensive operations in the region. He had already been preparing for the possibility for several months and had even intercepted British communications that revealed a British plan for a surprise assault on New Orleans. Galvez was not going to be caught unprepared. He kept secret his authorization for offensive actions and prepared to launch a preemptive strike. His offensive was delayed by a hurricane, which sank most of his fleet and destroyed provisions. But on August 27th, Galvez marched on Baton Rouge with a force of about 520 men, most of whom were recent recruits. Included were 10 American volunteers. The number grew as they continued to march upriver on Fort Butte, which sat at the far western border of British West Florida on Bayou Manchac. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Dixon was charged with protecting this area for the British, including Baton Rouge. He had around 400 regulars, a company of grenadiers from the German state of Waldeck, and a number of loyalist militia. Fort Butte was built in 1766, and by the time Galvez marched on it, it was in disrepair. Dixon decided it was indefensible, and upon receiving word of the Spanish attack, withdrew most of his forces, leaving only 20 Waldeckers to garrison the fort. Galvez had kept the purpose of the mission secret, even from the men he commanded, but on September 6th announced to his men that the Spanish had declared war on Great Britain, and that they were part of the opening salvo of Spanish operations in North America. The skirmish on September 7th was brief. One German was killed, and most of the others were captured. 
Only a few escaped to bring word of the fort's fall to Dixon. Galvez rested at the fort for several days before continuing his march to attack Baton Rouge, which lay only 15 miles from the fort. Dixon had conserved most of his forces for the battle and newly constructed fortifications dubbed Fort New Richmond. The fort was an earthen redoubt surrounded by an 18-foot wide, 9-foot deep moat and fortified with Dixon's entire command and 13 cannons. Galvez cut off communications between Baton Rouge and the other British sites and then ordered a feint by militia into a wooded area to distract the British forces. The British fired at the Spanish militia but killed only a few thanks to the thick woods. Galvez proceeded to use the time that he had gained to build his own siege trenches and gun pits, which were built within range of the fort. He positioned his artillery and began bombarding the British fort on September 21st. After three hours of bombardment, Dixon's entire force surrendered. The defeat was stunning. Only a handful of British were killed, but hundreds were captured. The British militia was disarmed, and Dixon surrendered not just Baton Rouge, but also Fort Panmure, located at modern Natchez, Mississippi, which would have presented a difficult obstacle to capture otherwise. The commander at Panmure was furious, and a local justice of the peace wrote that, in the mighty battle between Governor Galvez and Colonel Dixon, the Spaniards only lost one man, and some say not one. The English lost 25, and the commanding officer wounded his head on his tea table. Though the engagements were minor, the capture of Baton Rouge and the surrender of the British forces there secured the Mississippi for the Spanish, essentially depriving the British of any control of the vital river. This was a tremendous development, as it significantly reduced British freedom of action along the river, and prevented them from moving reinforcements or mounting campaigns from the west on the American colonies. And Galvez had managed it in less than a month, with a hastily put together force essentially without casualty. Elsewhere, American and Spanish forces continued to secure the Mississippi. At Lake Pontchartrain, an American force under Navy Captain William Pickles had crewed the captured British ship Rebecca, which they renamed the USS Morris in honor of Robert Morris, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. But the Morris was unfortunately sunk in the hurricane that delayed Galvez's expedition. So Pickles and his crew found another ship, a schooner armed with only five small cannons. The crew was poorly supplied, the ship not properly fortified, but Pickles sailed to Lake Pontchartrain from New Orleans anyway to harass British shipping. With 57 crew and flying a British ensign, they approached the sloop HMS West Florida on September 10th and captured it in a very violent action. Another action saw 14 Louisianans captured an English cutter with 54 Valdeck Germans aboard. The Louisiana ship waited in silence until the larger British ship had arrived and then opened fire, letting out such a shout that the crew of the British ship fled below deck. The Louisiana crew boarded and locked the hatches, successfully capturing the ship. Galvez next targeted Mobile, with Pensacola the last British strongholds in West Florida. On January 11, 1780, he assembled a force of about 750 at New Orleans. Delayed by storms, he arrived at Mobile Bay in February, reinforced by soldiers from Havana and Pickles' ship, now renamed the Galvestown. The fort that protected the bay was Fort Charlotte, originally built in 1716 and by 1779 in disrepair. It was garrisoned with around 300 men, some regulars and other loyalists and local volunteers. The British garrison hoped to be reinforced by troops from Pensacola, who did march in an attempt to relieve Mobile. On March 2nd, Galvez began his attack, bombarding the fort. The fort's walls were breached by cannon on March 13th, and the fort and the town were surrendered. It took Galvez some time to complete his campaign, though only Pensacola remained as a British outpost in West Florida. He attempted to launch an attack in the fall of 1780, but his fleet was scattered by a hurricane, and Pensacola was reinforced. A British counterattack at Mobile was repulsed in January of 1781. The following month, Galvez finally began his attack on Pensacola. The governor had collected troops in Cuba and was supported by French and Spanish fleet elements, including around 750 French soldiers. More reinforcements came from New Orleans and Mobile, and the first forces arrived on March 9th. The Spanish fleet commander refused to enter the bay after the first ship grounded, attempting to enter, forcing Galvez to take control of the Galvestown and several other Louisiana ships and sail into the bay himself. Ultimately, Galvez's forces would number nearly 8,000, while the British garrison numbers were only around 1,300 regulars, militia, and volunteers, along with around 500 Native American allies, mostly Choctaw. The Spanish prepared for a prolonged siege on the considerable defenses of the British West Florida capital, building extensive siege works and even a covered road to move supplies and troops. The end of April, Spanish batteries finally began their bombardment, though the Spanish fleet was forced to withdraw thanks to a hurricane that struck the area a week into the siege. Fighting in flooded trenches, Galvez issued a daily ration of brandy to keep up morale. On May 8th, a lucky howitzer shot hit the magazine of Fort Crescent, the fortification furthest from the city. The explosion killed 57 British troops, and the Spanish responded immediately with a charge of infantry. 
The fort was captured, which provided the Spanish with a new position for the artillery, which overpowered the other British forts. Realizing his position had been compromised, the British commander surrendered two days later. Over a thousand British troops surrendered, and the British were completely ousted from West Florida. Galvez was welcomed as a hero when he returned to Havana, and King Charles III made him a lieutenant general and governor of both Louisiana and West Florida. For entering the bay alone, he was authorized to put on his coat of arms the words, Yo solo, meaning only me, or I alone. Galvez's actions would lead to both East and West Florida being returned to the Spanish on conclusion of the Peace of Paris, and Florida would not become American until 1821. Galvez would also be appointed governor and captain general of Cuba. He was made a count. He also became viceroy of New Spain on the death of his father, the previous viceroy. He died at age 40, at the end of a typhus epidemic on November 30th, 1786. Though poorly remembered, the contribution by the Spanish, and especially the campaign by Galvez, were incredibly important to the eventual independence of the United States. Though Spain and France both had their own reasons for entering the war and clearly used the American Revolution to make their own gains separate of American independence, their assistance proved pivotal in expanding the war and making it one that the British could not win. Spanish supplies and money also helped support the siege of Yorktown, the last major land battle of the war. Galvez's initiative tied up British resources and captured important strategic ground that the British could have used to imperil the revolution. Today, many locations bear his name, including, of course, Galveston, Texas, and Galvez and St. Bernard Parishes in Louisiana. There are statues of him in New Orleans, Mobile, and Washington, D.C. And in 2014, Congress posthumously granted him honorary citizenship in the United States, an honor that has only been bestowed upon eight people in history, including Winston Churchill and Mother Teresa describing him as a hero of the Revolutionary War who risked his life for the freedom of the United States people. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguy.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.